Hello, everybody. My name's Ian, and I'm an addict. But I'm so much more than that today. I'm a university student, I'm an employee, and I'm a member of society that makes a positive contribution. It's not always been that way for me. I've known moments of desperation. And I want to talk to you today about what I call the gift of desperation. And I believe that these lessons are valuable to all of us and what happens when we don't feel connected to our humanity and loved. In my case, it was drugs. In your case, it may be compulsive eating, serial relationships, gambling. Ten years ago, I was in a police station for a shoplifting charge. I was sat at the table with a duty solicitor. She was warm and kind towards me, more so than I could ever be towards myself at that point. For I had abandoned the human being inside of me. I was 21 years old, I was six foot tall, eight stone in weight, hadn't washed or changed my clothes for weeks as I was street homeless. And I had track marks all up my arms from injecting crack cocaine and heroin every day. This solicitor was kind and warm towards me. She showed me compassion and love. And she told me that she used to have a drink problem. She doesn't drink anymore. And that provided me with a window of opportunity to be honest about feeling like I was going to be judged. I remember I sat back in the chair and I took a deep breath and I just said, I don't want to live like this anymore. But I didn't know what to do. And it's really important that the way I was living wasn't a choice. It wasn't self-inflicted. It wasn't an ethical dilemma or a moral deficiency because I didn't know there was another way to live. And if there was, it wasn't possible for someone like me. The only thing that was holding me together at that point in my life was denial. I now know that denial is a psychological coping strategy designed to keep us emotionally stable in very unstable times. Every time I was released from prison, if you asked me, Ian, are you going to use drugs? I would have said no. And if you lied me up to a, put me up to a lie detector test, I would have passed it because I was telling the truth. But I want you to know that every time I left prison, I couldn't stop because I didn't know how to. I didn't know that I suffered from an obsession beyond my mental control, which drove an, a, a compulsion to use drugs against my will. And every time I sold my values, I sold my hope, I sold my being, I gave up on everything that was important to me. And the, the, the sadness deep inside my soul had never left. I did not understand addiction. I, d I did not understand that I was sick. I did not understand that I had a problem. And I had the fear of abandonment. I believed that I was completely worthless. I had a belief that I was unworthy of receiving love. And I now know that our belief system is the engine that drives our behavior. My ego and self-destructive behavior patterns came from a sense of worthlessness. And I'd end up in a dark place, not knowing where to turn or how to escape. So why am I telling you this? Because I want you to know how it feels. I believe that people who are suffering from the, what we call for this argument, disease of addiction, deserve to be met with compassion, kindness, understanding, not to be rejected from society, starved of all social capital, which is survival, which is essential for human survival in modern day society. So I'm proposing that we change the narrative. The political undercurrent talks about the war on drugs. I get this, you know, drugs, you know, they devastate communities and families, and it's very intimidating, and we might feel like we're under attack. Gabor Maté, um, he's a doctor and a writer in addiction, a big inspiration of mine. He says that we can't wage war on an inanimate object, so therefore we are waging war on society's most vulnerable people. So I propose the question, by criminalising addicts, are we creating barriers to recovery? If a baby is put in an incubator when it's born, with little or no human contact, parts of the baby's brain won't develop. In more serious cases, the baby will die, even if the baby is given a nutritious diet in order to aid physical development. This is called the biopsychosocial model. So the biology of the brain is impacted by psychological and sociological factors. So if babies' brains won't develop with little or no human contact when we put them in an incubator, what do we expect to happen to adults when we incarcerate them whose addiction is a symptom of similar causes? I think we must understand people in different ways. In some respects, I propose that society, just like myself, is in desperation. The desperation is now 
that we must finally consider an alternative route. So I propose that we reconsider society's response. Does the criminal justice system work or does it create further barriers to recovery? Could more be done with people while they're in prison? Why are there not more treatment programs and facilities in prison? Drugs are not addictive. So if drugs are addictive, then anyone ever took a drug would be a drug addict. It's a myth to think they are. Drugs don't cause addiction. We have to ask why people are susceptible addi to addiction. So perhaps, could we decriminalise drugs? Could that work? Why are we scared of that idea? Why don't we have money to send someone to treatment, but we have £119,000 to put them in prison? So the Home Office states that 65% of drug charges are to, due to possession. The government spends £10 billion on the war on drugs every year. That's a lot of money for a war that I don't think is entirely real. There are 85,000 human beings in prison at any given time. 35% of that prison population are addicted to drugs. Each new prison place costs £119,000 to get them into prison. And what happens to the, the, the minute they become in conflict with the law to the point when they get in prison? From then on, every year it costs £40,000 to keep an individual in prison. One person being in prison for a year costs £159,000. The cost of a rehab for six months is £10,000. By taking someone to treatment, you're not only identifying who committed the crime, but you're identifying the reasons why they committed the crime. When you treat that, you rapidly reduce the risk of reoffending. So does this make economic sense? I'm not a criminologist. I'm not a professor in addiction or economics. I'm just an addict who got clean and found another way to live. And when I reflect, I just felt that so much more could be done. So I'm asking you, if someone you loved or cared about, or furthermore yourself, was in a similar situation, how would you want them to be treated? If you were in your moment, in your darkest hour, in your moment of desperation, would you want to be demonised, criminalised, marginalised, rejected from society, starved of social capital, removed from everyone that loves you? Or would you want to be met compassion, kindness, love and acceptance and give you some kind of solution? When I was at school, I thought all the other children got took to one side and was told, this is the secret for living life, but whatever you do, don't tell Ian. I was convinced there was this book, this lesson, this memo or something. I observed all the other children at school and they just knew what to do. They knew how to interact and talk and engage, and I was at a loss. Ultimately, I felt lost and alone. I even asked one of my peers, and I said, have they told you something and told you not to tell me? He looked at me like I was bonkers. I get it now. But I had a predisposition within myself, and I projected that onto the environment around me. And that's why I felt like that. And I looked back at my school experience, and it was all about telling me what to think, but not how to think. And for an emotionally preoccupied, extremely sensitive child like me, I was never going to fit into the status quo. And I've realised that the world does not give us permission to truly feel what we feel and have the human experience that we're all here to do. I couldn't rock up to the breakfast table as a child and say, listen, I feel really unworthy of receiving love today, everybody. You know, when I'm smoking a spliff from my pal on a park bench and I'm getting into drugs, listen, mate, I feel really scared and insecure right now. I couldn't say that stuff. I had to suppress it. And I couldn't suppress it, so I had to self-medicate to manage that. See, I'd like you to imagine, perhaps, maybe a school system that nurtured the human experience a bit more. I'd like you to imagine that on your first day of school, you were met with a teaching team that said, welcome. We are a teaching team that is dedicated to your development. We love and accept you just the way you are, and we can't wait for you to flourish into the beautiful human beings you're all destined to be. So I'm asking, could more of our school system be a support? Could school be an arena where we take less of a focus on the academic learning and more of a focus on the human experience? Teaching kindness, giving, relationship building, feelings, thinking, self-value, self-esteem. Surely this is the path that drives us closer to our humanity and in supporting children on the human experience they're embarking on.
I personally feel that this might help create a healthier society and manage some of the symptoms like addiction. It takes wisdom to see intention, but we're often judged in our actions. I was misunderstood for a long time. My focus and driver is that I want people to experience what I experienced. I was met with love and acceptance, compassion and kindness. The therapeutic value of one added helping another runs out parallel, and I really believe that we must build on this. Change is possible. And I recognise that some of the things that I'm talking about involves change. And I know that change is scary. But in my experience, it's not as scary as doing it, and resistance to change is harder than change. We need to change the attitudes in the minds of each individual. I want to talk to you about a story quickly. Today, I choose to stay drug-free. I've been blessed with an opportunity. I couldn't be held responsible for my addiction because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know how to stop. But as a human being, I recognise I have to be accountable, and that's why I went to prison. But I, 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 although I choose to stay clean today, it's really important that you know that choice has been hard for me. It's probably the hardest choice I've ever made, and I only don't use just for today, even after all this time. And after about three years of recovery, I relapsed. I believed a lie that I wasn't worth it, that I didn't deserve it that I was worthless and I was unworthy of receiving love. And I behaved in ways that self-medicated that feeling until eventually I used. And I said, I'm just going to have one, just to manage with this feeling, just one, just because I can't bear this pain any longer. Five days later, I'm injecting heroin down the train tracks and I'm in this city called Bristol and I reached out to one of my friends from the recovery support groups. And I called him and I just said, I've really messed up and I don't know what to do. He says, I'm going to come and get you. So he picked me up and he took me to a recovery support group. And halfway through the meeting, I fell off the chair because the heroin was strong and I hadn't used it for a long time. And he got up and walked across the room and he picked me up off the chair and he put his arms around me and he, he rubbed my back and he said to me, Ian, you don't have to be frightened. It's going to be okay. And we're going to get through this together because I love you and I don't want anything bad to happen to you. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that is because love is the weapon of our choice. That's, 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 that's the weapon that we have. Our humanity, our connectedness to each other, our compassion, our understanding. I didn't have a defence for love. Reject me from society. Put me in an environment where the way I have to behave is conducive to my survival, isn't conducive to what I'm trying to promote now. That's familiar to me, but I don't want that to be familiar. I don't want to have to use those barriers and end defences anymore. I want love. My friend, after about seven years of recovery, he had some back pain and he went to the doctor and the doctor prescribed him with Valium for his back. The Valium set off the obsession to use drugs, which created the compulsion and he couldn't stop and he reverted back to street drugs and he went to prison. And I remember being in prison, that, that torture in that cell, the obsession, the loneliness, the degradation, the desperation. And every time you're in that situation, you know, you, you hurt people because you, you don't know what else to do. And you run because the terror is back. Relapse is really painful. And my friend took his life because he couldn't cope with that feeling. And I often hear recovering addicts say, if I relapse, if I'm lucky, I'll die. If I'm unlucky, I'll live for a long time. And that's because that's a representation of how painful it is. But I don't believe my friend had to die. I don't believe that he had to be in that cell on his own. I believe that society could have had a healthier, healthier nurturing, more huma humanitarian response. So I'm calling on you to please reconsider how we feel about people in the grips of addiction. And just it's funny, today is, um, of all days, um, my sister has gone into rehab. And, you know, so it's been emotional. And I'm on the phone to my brother this morning, and I'm, you know, in my stuff around this TED talk, and, you know, because I want it to be good. I don't, I don't want to be an amazing speaker. I just want you to hear what I have to say, and I'm hoping that 
you can change something in the way you see things, and that can have a collective response, you know. But and I'm talking to my brother who's been working really hard to get her in there. We both have, and, and you, she won't get in the car, she won't get in the car. You know, and I'm driving here, and I'm on my way here, and, and I said to him, you just need to tell her that, you know, she's scared, and we need her to be brave right now. You know, and, and she is so courageous, and she's on her way, and she's getting there. And, and it really took back to me how scared I was when I looked at myself and when I decided to live this new way of life that I didn't know what it meant. And people in recovery, they're the most courageous people you will ever meet. Deep, sensitive, caring, compassionate. We've been in the gutter. We've been on Britain's scrap heap. People ignored us. I was sitting outside shops, homeless, hungry, cold. And people treat me different today. And we, a reflection of society, a true reflection is how we treat our most vulnerable members of society. So I would like to dedicate this talk to my sister, who I'm extremely proud of, my mother, who, who lost her life to this illness three years ago, and all the friends of mine that have died. And I pray that they rest in peace as we try to understand more of what they suffered with. My name's Ian, I'm a recovering addict. Thank you.